The journalist Christopher Hitchin writes that he's often described, to his irritation, as a contrarian, although the word was used in the title of one of his books by his publisher. He thinks it's a pity we don't have a good vernacular word for an oppositionist or for someone who tries to do their own thinking. He believes dissident has to be won or earned, while gadfly and maverick are over full of self-regard. So I'll just call him a journalist. He loves an argument. He gets bored easily. He admits to insecurity. For 30 years he smoked like a chimney, and he admits to drinking enough to kill a mule. He's as sharp as a tack, too. His friend Ian McEwan once said of him that it all seemed neurologically available. Everything he's ever read, everyone he's ever met, every story he's ever heard. How enviable. Christopher Hitchens is here today to mull over a life making his presence felt, his views known, his arguments conducted on the public stage. The question is, where does music fit into this life? We'll discover a bit of that by listening to what he's chosen for us to hear. Here's the first. As crisp as a winter morning, the third movement from the Brandenburg Number no. 2 by Bach, and it was André Bernard was the trumpeter with the Academy of St Martin in the field, directed by our guest Christopher Hitchens. Good morning to you. <laughs> Good morning. Thanks That's for having me. the kind of morning. <coughs> doesn't, Excuse doesn't me. It? it makes me go husky listening to them. Why? Well, let me think. Um, the Reverend Sidney Smith, who was a great Victorian essayist, um, was once asked how he would imagine paradise. And you know, most religious people are very good at telling what hell would be like. They've hardly ever come up with a plausible heaven. And the Reverend Smith said, that's easy. He said, it would be eating caviar to the sound of trumpets. Ah. <laughs> so I wish I had some caviar now. Um, yes. it's, it, it has that soaring quality to it. Um, and speaking of soaring, I believe, in fact, I think I'm sure, that it's one of the pieces that's on the space uh, probe uh, Voyager that's been fired out, I forget how many years ago you might remember, in the possible hope of encountering another intelligent civilization. So they can put pop it, it into inside, their CD it has, player. Inside, it has our, inside there are various little items that include our claim to be civilized ourselves. And mm. That's one of the pieces that made it. And William F. Buckley, who I think had the idea of including it, when asked should we put in the Brandenburg, as signature of our civilization, said, well, we probably should, though it might count as boasting. <laughs> <laughs> and um, speaking of Mr. Buckley... Um, he used this as the signature music, the theme music for his long-time TV show, Firing Line, mm. which has an evo evocation to me because it was the going on that and debating with him when I was younger was the sort of start of my TV career. He was very right-wing, and he was the man to beat in my mind, but he was very generous in having opponents on. Can we talk about right and left? Um, uh, I guess. Well, in the olden days, you were, you were very strongly identified with the left, the left of politics, and I'm interested, not, um, I will come to your shift, or if there has been a shift, but what's the situation today regarding the philosophic underpinnings between the poles? Well, I used to argue very strongly that those who said that left-right distinction was not very important anymore, that we lived in a post-ideological age, were wrong. And I think actually in the 60s I was, I was right. People who published books like Daniel Bell's End of Ideology at the beginning of that decade didn't see coming. But there were plenty of ideologies around. There were, and I think they were, I think they were real and I think they actually did represent things. But what's happened now in my life experience, which is part of what I try and cover in my, my memoir, is that the left has moved from becoming something of a status quo force, very much content with very many of the ways things are now, to in some ways even being uh, conservative, even, even reactionary. In other words, a status quo such as, I know you're going to ask me, um, or I know it's in people's minds, the private ownership of the state of Iraq by the Saddam Hussein crime family. Most of the left were against any move to change that. I thought it, it was remarkable, I must argue, some kind of qualitative degeneration, mm. that people would actually go out in the streets and positively demonstrate for the things in Iraq to remain the way they were. I thought something's gone wrong with the left if this can happen, and it's no longer going to include me at any rate. For any... For any but I would say my position was the more radical one. Yes. And, and a, well, I wonder whether that's because you feel uncomfortable with any notion of being associated with the right that you'd rather think that the left has lost its way rather than that you've changed your position? Well, the right, per se, has very few charms for me, and I don't think of myself as any kind of conservative. That's to include the word neo, mm. or the term neo, well, the recently neo invented term, which actually is, is as inaccurate as it could possibly be. I even know the person, Michael Harrington, leader of the American Socialist Party, who coined it as a sort of joke about friends of his who he thought had moved to the right. 
Um, in, in truth, the neoconservatives were in favor of making war on the status quo. They were in favor of using force to change it. Whatever you call that, it's not a conservative position. The thing that I'm curious about, though, is this business of having to a, a sense of uh, that someone wants to align themselves with what of whatever ideology underpins these poles. In in is there a conflict in your opinion there? with that sort of tribal need yes. to with <clears throat> wanting to be someone who thinks independent. Well that's why my book is called Hitch twenty two because the, the the allusion to Joseph Heller's so famous catch is that I found at the end of a life which has involved commitment to a number of causes, n not many of which I wouldn't do again by the way. The, my strongest commitment now is to a group of people some of the names would be known to people like Richard Dawkins, whose ma main principle is that of doubt and uncertainty and scepticism because these appear to be the rules that govern nature and evolution and the cosmos. So the only thing to be sure of is that you can't be certain. And the only thing to be certain of is that the uncertainty principle is very strong. And anyone who says they already have all the information they need to form an opinion is, is fooling themselves and trying to fool other people. Well, uh, so I, I find I can be very strongly committed to this rather non-committal, rather open-minded, open-ended faction. But does that... Um, I, I, I sort of hesitate to get into the, the question of religion and God and all of that because it's such a huge topic, but that adherence to atheism in, on your part is, is just as string, strong, as lacking in doubt, isn't it? I would say not because the atheist position is that it cannot be shown that there is a God. No evidence has ever been produced for it, and no argument has ever been adduced that's convincing, so that one is entitled to say, um, the, in the absence of that, the proposition falls. Mm -hmm. But you can't assert that you know there isn't a God. That would be taking a, a quasi-religious position. In just the same way, I don't have a special word for saying I don't believe in Santa Claus or the Tooth Fairy. I don't, and I, 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 don't, I don't expect to have to explain it to people. Yeah. There's certainly no need for a special word for it. Is and atheism is unsatisfactory because all it tells people is what you don't believe, whereas in the approach to reason and science, I think this is a very strong positive. We say, look, the universe is already wonderful enough, the material world, the cosmos, nature. It's, in fact, almost miraculous in how beautiful and interesting it is. You don't need to make supernatural assumptions. Is there... In your, in you, then, a a, a, um, a foundation of thought or belief or value or morality that underpins everything that you've attached yourself to through your life that that, that hasn't changed. Yeah, uh, would be that um, uh, no one is good enough to be another person's master. If they're going to be giving orders, they have to earn the right to do it. They can't inherit it. It can't be assumed of them. And no one has access to information that's denied to me. The, His Holiness the Pope knows exactly as much as I do, or maybe even a bit less about the material and, and, and also the invisible world. He's, he's not been given any revelation that I can't have. You'd, you'd include the it's, Dalai Lama in uh, that, Of course you? I'd include the Dalai Lama. And, and any, anyone else who made a claim to have... A, as it were, access to... Inside knowledge. Yeah, uh, invisible means of support, as you, might, as you might say. And to keep it musical for a second, after all, one of the objections I encounter is often, well, what about religious music and devotional painting and poetry and architecture? Things of this kind, they, they appear to have this numinous, wonderful quality that isn't available to the secular world. True. I mean, it, I, I think it's a very interesting objection, and Bach is one of the things that makes you think it. Though it isn't strictly devotional, you have the sense that it's inspired. And I'm, I'm, I'm quite content with the, with the irony there. But these things are, they, they remain man-made, even though we can't just reduce them to manufacture. So your, your lack of acceptance or intolerance of somebody, as, of, of a hierarchy of power or knowledge, is something that you've always adhered to? Yes. I mean, progress, innovation, discovery... Enlightenment all, all comes from combat, from the assumption that there is nothing sacred, that everything can and must be questioned and challenged, and that synthesis will occur from clash. So when people say, oh, well, argument produces more heat than light, they're making a mistake by definition because there is only one source of light, and that is heat. Who do you like to argue with? What's, what sort of person? Well, I'll give you an example, and I'll stay with the, with the one I started with, um, William Buckley, the late. Um, 
very distinguished and very sophisticated conservative intellectual and very devout Roman Catholic. And I used to wish I could get on his show because I thought, you know, if I could, if I could grapple with him, if I could beat him, I, I'd really be proud of myself. If I could hold my own, I'd be pretty proud. And in any case, I'd be learning the ropes myself. I'd be improving my own debating style. Finally, he did have me on and was very generous to me. And um, it, it's appalling to me now to see in the United States the conservative cause represented in the media by just gaping idiots and loudmouth thugs like Glenn Beck and Rush Limbaugh, people who I, I simply, I could always understand even when I disagreed with him acutely why William Buckley had people's respect and admiration. I can't, I just don't get it with you. Are things. you scared of people like that in, sen in the sense of scared for the American culture? Well, because I'm just thinking maybe a Rush Limbaugh is essential because you have these extremes to which people can then react. Well, my friend Ian McEwan, who you mentioned earlier, has a wonderful phrase for this in one of his novels. It's called A Child in Time. It's an early one, one of his best, where someone, a man who's undergoing a terrible nervous breakdown over the loss of a child is reduced to watching a lot of daytime TV and he sees his fellow citizens queuing up, wanting to humiliate themselves and wanting to act like a herd of morons and idiots. And he, he thinks, what's wrong with this? Why is it so depressing? And he comes up with a phrase for it, which is um, the pornography of the Democrat. <laughs> All those who believe, you know, it, that people can be enlightened, that they can be educated, that they can be raised up a, a few mental notches. And so look at this, and you think, oh, well, maybe I'm dealing with the wrong human material. Yeah. Um, an Are awful you... temptation which, to which I think one has no right to succumb. Do you argue because you want to change people's minds? No, I argue actually in the hope of re refining my own. And that's what I get out of it, is, is that by the end of an argument I hope that my own positions will be clearer, and clearer to me, and perhaps better, to you. And better phrased. Well, uh, I hope I, if, if others benefit from it, that would be for them to say. No, it's interesting because a number of authors, and we've spoken to a couple this week, say that what they believe reveals itself through their writing. And I, I, you're saying that through your arguments and through your well, writing. Well, I try to write as if I'm talking. And I think whatever success my style may have is because the people feel, sometimes tell me they feel they're being personally addressed, mm. though I don't know them. I always take that as a very great compliment. Can we hear the music that you've chosen next? It comes from the planets. It's the Jupiter by Holst. Tell us what we hear, what part of it we're hearing and why. You're hearing a particular part of the Jupiter uh, sequence, which um, in English liturgy is also, it's a song title, it's, um, or rather it's a tune title called Thaxted, which is the very, very beautiful village in Sussex. <laughs> I knew I'd say Sussex. Suffolk, where Holst lived and worked, and to it, about which he cared. And in my, in my book I write quite a lot about my love for the English countryside, especially the southern and eastern uh, parts around Sussex and Hampshire and then up around Cambridgeshire and Suffolk mm. and Norfolk. It means an awful lot to me. And then if we listen to it, I could also tell you about the words that have been set to it um, as, a, as a tune. But here's Thaxted. So that's the melody. Um, and a lot of your more veteran and whiskery listeners will need no telling that that <laughs> like is the, the Anzac. <laughs> well, I'm thinking of the, even the, the Anzac ones, say. Yes. We'll need no telling that well, it's a melody that's used very, at all big occasions in England, isn't very, it? Well, it's a very, very famous um, hymn uh, called I Vow to Thee My Country, um, and the words for which were written by a man called Sir Cecil Spring Rice, who was working then at the British Embassy in Washington, very near where I live and have lived for these many years. He was a friend of Rudyard Kipling's and Theodore Roosevelt's, and he, he produced very beautiful devotional words that are they're very patriotic, um, without being chauvinistic, it seemed, without being xenophobic, and they're very often played at ANSAC ceremonies. Yes. In fact, the only time of year I ever voluntarily go to church is on the 11th of, of November in Washington, where there's a little ceremony in an old stone uh, church called uh, St. David's in a little fold of the park. Um, we, we have a very green city, and it's where the um, envoys of Great Britain and Australia and New Zealand and Canada have their annual uh, Remembrance, Armistice Day. Event, it's, it's always sung. Mm. Tell me about prep school, because you heard that when you were at prep school. Yes, it was a feature of my boarding school life. It was a, a regular anthem. Um, and one of the ones that, once you've had that sort of 
background, it, 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 it keeps on recurring to you, as do certain words from the Old and New Testament. They'll, you'll, if you've ever had that education, it'll never go out of your head. It's in your DNA, yeah, after a while, isn't it? Let me ask you about your mother, who you write, you devote a chapter to each of your parents. Your mother, Yvonne, your father, the commander. It was, an, it was a, a, a army family, wasn't it? Navy. You, well, sorry, Navy family yeah. that you came from. And, um, but your mother sounds like a delicious woman, actually. Oh, well, you, you don't know how you please me by saying that. I mean, it, was, it took me a long time to decide to write about her and to hope that I brought her life to other people, as, she I, sounds as I wish I could. She sounds lovely. What, tell yes, me about her. Yes, she was her. very nice. And, yeah, and she also was in the Navy. She volunteered during the Second World War to join the Women's Royal Navy. Met my father in Scarpa Flow, a very bleak, tough base in the Orkney Islands. Um, one, the, the, the very important for the all important battle of the Atlantic, in which um, and the uh, and the convoys over the Arctic to Russia, in which my father took a very heroic part. Mm. What was the attraction well, between them? I, I I've often asked myself because it was clear to me, even when I was quite small, that they shouldn't probably have married. I mean, they weren't meant for each other at all. My father was very gruff, very taciturn, very pessimistic. My mother was very outgoing, very. <clears throat> gay, as people would once have said, um, committed to gaiety, um, optimistic, um, gregarious. Ambitious for you? And very ambitious for her sons, yes, of whom I was the first, and um, prepared to make a lot of sacrifices so that I, I became the first member of my family to go to a private school or to any kind of university. Did you stick out like a sore thumb there? Um, no, I, I, have, I can get on at close quarters with people, but I think I was somewhat obnoxious and precocious. My mother taught me to read much earlier than most boys did. And I was usually ahead of the class in reading and didn't mind showing off about it. And that can get you flicked with a wet towel every now and then in a, Were you bullied? In a boys' school. I was a bit small for my age and sometimes got picked on, but I was also fairly quick-tongued, so I was able to... to Make, sometimes able to make bullies back off by saying something wounding to yes, them. You really, it was you, an early training in how words can be weapons. Yes, you write about that, about suddenly realising words could be weapons. Yes, yeah, like, actually, I suddenly saw the guy's expression change. He looked totally disconcerted. Because you I'd called him a thought, big thug, didn't you? I said, well, uh, I called attention to a few of his features that he, <laughs> I thought required a bit more underlining than they'd so far had. So that's useful to know. Um, and you, you do learn about self-defence when you're among a load of young male primates. Was that the grounding for the com what a lot of people, and I think you probably agree with this about yourself, a, a, a somewhat combative nature um, in you? What do you think? That yes, you realise that if you didn't stick up for yourself, no one else is going to do it for you. Um, it had a big effect on me politically as well, because I, I knew that my, my mother had more or less forced my father to scrape together the dough, which he didn't think we could afford, to send me to get a, get a head start in education. So I consider myself very lucky and also rather obliged to make sure I didn't goof off or fail. What? And I was appalled by the discovery that most of my school fellows thought it was their perfect right to be at a privileged school. It was no more than their due. And they, they were very contented about it. And I immediately sort of set me in a... In a, in a mode of attrition against all the assumptions of the conservatism that underlay mm, that. Very interesting. What became of your mother? Because you reveal this in the book and it's a very poignant and very, very sad story. Well, having left it, I think, too late and probably having left it too late because she didn't want to get divorced. Divorce was still quite scandalous in those days in her class. Having, I think, quite literally stayed with my father because of my brother and myself, when we were gone to university or beyond, she took up, I think, having left it too late, with a, a lover who was not like my father. He was, he was much more outgoing and um, he was a bit of an amateur poet. He was an ex-priest of the Church of England, actually, a ruined priest, a charmer, but also unlike my father in being a complete spendthrift, an unreliable type, a shifty person, I, I suspect, and, and probably bipolar. And when things didn't work out, I think she thought, that she'd had her last chance and wasn't going to get another one and she was at a time of life when she, having been very beautiful, was losing her looks. I, this is my speculation. I can't think of any, any other combination of things that would have made her think she didn't want to go on living. Anyway, they made a pact of suicide together. They went to Greece, to Athens, and um, ended their lives jointly. Um, 
though it was first reported very traumatically for me as a murder. So when I went to see my mother's uh, scene of death, it was, a, it was a, actually it was a crime scene. But I, I later found it, he hadn't murdered her, as I'd originally been told he had. To add to the so, trauma for you, you found that the telephone record showed she'd been trying to call you for yes. a couple of days. Have you, how have you reconciled? Because, I mean, there's... The, it, it's such a human response that you'd think, God, if only I'd picked up the phone. Yeah, well, that's what I do still think. Um, because we were we were very close, and we had almost identical sense of humour. And I'm sure that if she'd called, she might have been she might have called in a very gloomy voice, and she might have indeed been calling to tell me I'm ringing to say goodbye. But I would have said something that would have mm. made her laugh at herself. How do you think it's? I'm, I know I would have been able to. Um, I'm not boasting. We just we had that kind of rapport. And she tried often, so I think she was, may even have been hoping <clears throat> that I would s supply her with a handhold. How do you think this is? Are you, are you sort of dispassionate enough about it now to be able to think how it's had, it, what impact it's had on you subsequently? This episode, not just her death, but I mean, I don't, I don't feel, I, I do reproach myself for never being in and for going out on the town. I was a young person in London then; I hadn't been there long. I had, I wasn't particularly thinking about my parents. Um, but I don't, it doesn't make me feel guilty. I'm, I, I'm, I'm suspicious of people who blame themselves too easily. I think mm -hmm. that's often a bad sign. But certainly a very great remorse and also conviction, consciousness of the fragility of life, how quickly people can find that it's over or wish that it was. Mm. You went on to Oxford from, yeah. from school. Well, you were at Oxford when your mother died, I think, weren't you? No, I, you, I, you'd finished? I was about 23. I'd, I'd moved to London. I'd got quite a nice job on a magazine called The New Statesman, which had a certain amount of prestige in those days, and I was just sort of starting out in, as a young scribbler. A scribbler and an activist, and I'm interested yes, in that... and compulsive socialite, and I mean, I was, you know, I was burning the candle at both ends. Well, you were having a good life, while I mean, you were enjoying trying, it. Well, my mother was trying desperately to call me. Well, there yes, we are. So anyway, on. I don't want to get more fish uh, about that. No, and I think that... If, it, if that chapter, which you're so kind about, has any merit, it would be, I think it does avoid sentimentality. It certainly does. It Thank certainly you. does, for this reader, anyway. But the picture I got of you um, in, the, in the wake of that, but not as a result of that is of a young man just sowing his oats, having a good time, forming friendships, many of which have lasted through your life. Yes. And, and really getting into the action. You weren't a bystander, you weren't an observer, you were a participant at the, in every sense of the word. Why do you think you were? Why not take the easier <coughs> road and know what you believed and went about your work? Well, when I was young... I mean, in other words, when I was turning 17, 18, it was 1968. I suppose 18, 19 by then. I was born in 1949. And so every generation has its moment of rebellion, whatever you want mm. to call it, or dissent. But very often it is without a cause, whereas it's, things so fell out that the, in my year, we, we did have a cause. And it looked as if there was going to be, we were in fact living through a worldwide revolution. I, I try in the book to convey to people what that feels like if you're young, and you think the world is undergoing an enormous, painful, but beautiful change for the better, and you have a chance to take part in it. I mean, I, I'm very sorry for people who haven't had that experience. Had you been born at a different, I mean, it's a speculation, but had you been born in a different time, like 1959 or 69, would you, do you think it was that, that you are what you are because of the times in which you lived? <clears throat> or that To a very great extent, yes, though I now realise, and I say in the book, that what was happening in places like France, Paris, th that year, and looked to me like the beginning of a socialist, a, a revival of the red left. And in fact, it didn't take me very long to work out that actually what we were seeing was the last flowering of it. It was the end of it. But, but we, we were seeing the beginning of something, which I also did have a, a small part in. The beginning of the real revolution that occurred in Eastern Europe and ended with the fall of the Berlin Wall. Yeah. And I was a member of a very extreme... Uh, eccentric um, Marxist group of school. Was this the Luxembourg? Yes, we, we, Rosa Luxembourg and Leon Trotsky were our sort of theoretical grounding. And I've we heard very, it described we, as a cult. Oh, well, no, I would say not. Yeah. I mean, there have been Trotskyist cults, that's true. Mm. Um, Leader-dominated splinter groups, yes, but I would, I would acquit us on that charge. We were very close with the people in Poland and Czechoslovakia who were organising opposition to Stalinism, and I, I was very sure at that time that 
something germinal was happening in Eastern Europe. And I think 68 was the beginning of something that mm. culminates in 1989. Very interesting. So, and I, wrote, I have a chapter about going to Poland and being involved in some of that, being arrested in Czechoslovakia. And therefore, to, Thomas Paine once said um, that to have had a part in two revolutions is to have lived to some purpose. Now, he was, he was a seminal figure in both the American and the French revolutions. I can't claim anything like that, but, but to have been a witness to a very, very fringe participant in those events, I think has been very useful to me. And mm. I would do a lot of it again, though there are some things I said in those days that still survived to embarrass me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, this is Dylan. This is Dylan. Ah, ah, what are we listening yes. to? What are we hearing? This is a song called Spanish is the Loving Tongue. It's quite hard to get, and it's um, absolutely hauntingly brilliant. And those people who only know his later work when his voice is somewhat shot. Um, Philip Larkin once described Dylan's voice as being cawing and derisive, as yeah. it is, and so have to listen to this and, and see how beautiful he can be. Bob Dylan. Yes. Um, I wouldn't have recognized it. No, and don't you like the way it keeps you guessing? Because you first you have this old deadbeat rehearsing a torch song <laughs> and can't go south of the border anymore because he's wanted for a gambling fight. And then there's this almost parody mariachi noise where you mm. think, you know, you wouldn't put it in a bad score <laughs> of a crap movie about <laughs> the Mexican border. And then he just suddenly swings into it. Mm. Uh, haven't seen her since that night. Fantastic. Um, Spanish and, is the loving tongue. Spanish is the loving tongue. And now... I'm very redolent. I'm trying to revive it um, in the United States. It's hard to get for some reason. It's not collected very much as that region becomes more bilingual and as the south of the border thing becomes very much more tense and, and interesting. Arizona's just passed another law, it hasn't it? It certainly has, yeah. Our guest is Christopher Hitchens. Um, this, you talk about 1968 and how it was the, the beginning of something which I guess end, do you, do you think that ends in 89 when the wall comes down? Well, that's, that's in the east, so to speak, in the, in, the, in the, the west, in the capitalist world, as we would then have called it. I mean, there were, there were certain things that definitely were the harbinger of greater things to come, certainly the American Civil Rights Movement. When did you... And your... the movement against the war in Indochina. But the idea that there would be, once again, an alliance of workers and intellectuals under the red flag that would transform society, that's the last time that happened, except there are echoes of it in Portugal in the revolution of 1974, which I was I also have a chapter about. Um, but again, this was the last rather colourful spasm of something rather than the inauguration of one. Is there a, a, a single event that you can nominate that marks the beginning of your shift from the far left um, across the pole a little, the, the, the axis a little? Well, I haven't crossed it. It's not true to say that. I mean, I still get attacked in the American... Uh, right-wing press for being a Leninist about Iraq. I mean, mm. remember that... Was it Iraq a, a that huge, did it? Well, no, it wasn't. But just for an example, I mean, people forget that uh, just as a lot of the left, almost all the left in Iraq, for example, support the removal of Saddam Hussein, which I felt I had a duty to my comrades there. Quite a lot of people on the left in Europe and America also did, and very many people on the right were opposed. People like my brother, who's a very leading conservative commentator in Britain, who says... It takes a fool like his elder brother to support such an obviously left-wing war as the one in Iraq. I think he's closer to the mark than the people who, who simplified into right and left. Just by the way, can I interpolate a question Please. here? The, the, what I, have I, I said no? No, I can... <laughs> <laughs> well, then I'd say all right. The, the, the Robert Mugabe figure yes. bothers me here because you saw the, the need and the right of America to invade to get rid of Saddam Hussein from yes. Iraq. What about Mugabe doing much the same sort of thing in his country? Well, the perfectly fair question. Um, sorry, that sounds patronising. I mean, very searching question. But here, are the, I think there are four, I'll say it quickly, the four conditions under which a state can be deemed to have lost its sovereignty or sacrificed part of it and made itself open to a UN resolution requiring intervention. And the customarily, these would be invading and occupying the territory of a neighbouring state. <clears throat> fooling around with the non-proliferation treaty or with illegal acquisition of weapons mm -hmm. of mass destruction, committing genocide or planning to do so. Mugabe. Or, and or giving its support and succor to international terrorist organizations. Now, Iraq was multiply guilty on all four of those things. Um, and is actually, I think, the only state um, of which that can be said. 
um, and two-thirds of it was already under no-fly zones imposed from outside and also a regime of international sanctions. It had lost its sovereignty. It was really a matter of how long it was going to stay half Saddam and half not Saddam. And I thought we should resolve it in the non-Saddam favor. I think the reasoned case can be made for that. With Robert Mugabe, or say with Rwanda, if you have knowledge in advance of a plan to exterminate a whole section of the population, you are obliged by law, if you've signed the convention, to intervene. And we did know of that plan in Rwanda and didn't intervene to our eternal shame. It's a question as to whether Mugabe can be accused of genocide. He does use the weapon of food denial to coerce people to vote for him. Um, and I certainly wouldn't be sorry if... Um, and a bit of a bullet here on it. Well, you know, we, in, in Washington, you know, it's still illegal to talk about assassination of a head of government. If you no, 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 no. I'm saying he used the threat of the... the oh, the, to, uh, to the, say the least. No, it's, a, it's, an, well. it's, a, it's an appalling, it's an absolutely abysmal regime, and it's a huge indictment of its, of its African neighbours that they haven't taken any steps to try and discipline it and bring it back into the international community. But is it an but it indictment but I'm sorry of the United say, States I'm, that I'm it not didn't. sorry to say, I mean, well, I'm glad to say that it doesn't rise anywhere near the level of outrage to international law that was committed okay. by Saddam Hussein. Okay. But it was, I think it was Salman... And if you, if you have those four criteria in mind, um, you'll see that he doesn't, he doesn't really reach any of them. The Iranians have not invaded the territory of another state, though I think they propose to do so. You said WMD, didn't you? And yes. Wasn't it true that they weren't found in Iraq? Well, the, Iraq had, was the only government that had used them twice. Against the Kurds? Against the Kurds and against the Iranians. Mm. Um, and had the ability to recuperate them, in my opinion, and the intention of doing so when the sanctions were lifted. It's not a question of whether they had stockpiles. This is a false issue, I believe. There were some centrifuges and other things and some plans found, it, though people pretend that doesn't matter. It was more that they didn't come into conformity with the international community's resolutions and never intended to do so. But now, Iraq is in conformity with those resolutions. I think that's progress, even if other people don't. We've digressed from the question that I asked about the, uh, the, the, the event. There was a Oh, yes. Event. No, for me, the defining... Yeah, Rushdie, here's a crucial... Rushdie. Yes, the, you, you're absolutely right. The ma major date for me is not 11th of September 2001, though I do have a whole chapter about that. It's the 14th of February, Valentine's Day, 1989, when the theocratic dictator of a foreign state, the Ayatollah Khomeini, offers money in his own name to suborn murder of a novelist who isn't an Iranian, Salman Rushdie. living in London, who happened to be a friend of mine, but I think my attitude, what I know, would have been the same. And to my astonishment, a huge number of people thought that the person at fault in this was Salman, that it was his fault for writing a novel that upset the faithful. And among the people who made this fatuous, drew this fatuous conclusion, were a lot of people who I had thought of hitherto as fairly reliable on questions of the Enlightenment and ordinary issues of liberty versus theocracy, and I was wrong. They, they tried to explain it away or even to justify it. And I began to realize then that something had gone very rotten in the postmodern left, that they'd become completely relativist, that they were, they were looking for signs of something progressive, so to say, in, um, in re reactionary religious turmoil in the third world. They were misinterpreting that as some kind of anti-capitalist protest. But they're still making that idiotic and lethal mistake. Can you introduce the Wagner for us? Yes, you're going to hear not all because it's more than eight minutes, but the the most impressive and in some ways menacing, um, uneasy making uh, funeral of Siegfried from Goethe Dameron. Gee, it's dramatic stuff, isn't it? Yes, the the twilight of the gods, and it comes in my love-hate category, um, mm. the admiration I feel for the unbelievable majesty, um, and yet terrible gloom of, and menace of, um, of Wagner. I describe in, in my book a family secret that I discovered fairly late in life. That my, my mother was of Jewish ancestry and had kept it to herself, I think not wanting my brother and myself to be exposed to mm. any, any unpleasantness. And, um, her family origin is in those menacing, I've used, overused the word now, those hotly contested and very bleak borderlands of Germany and Poland, that, that frontier that every, every time it changes, something terrible happens. Yes. And as well as giving, I've been there, I've made a sort of roots trip to have a look and um, 
as well as giving me a very great interest in the part of me that's Jewish, I also realize it gives me a stake and an interest in being German and being Polish. And the music of Wagner was the, an occasion for a huge clash about German identity between himself and Friedrich Nietzsche. Nietzsche was one of those who thought that the destiny of the German soul, people, lay in the study of the South, the Mediterranean, classical Greece, which it, that, that should be the reconciliation. That, that's the way Germany should orient itself. There was always this other view in Germany, no, that the, the great yearning was for the East, for the huge dark forests and rolling plains, the Lebensraum, the living room, so-called. Mm -hmm. And when, when Nietzsche heard uh, the ring cycle, the ring of the Nibelungs, of which this is the climactic ending, he realized that Wagner had sold out. He was going for the East. He was going for the dark blood myths and Nordic um, obsessions. Mm -hmm and not for the light and, and beauty and open spaces of, of um, Athens. And, of course, that's a civilizational catastrophe, if rendered we, in music. If we go west, we come to France, yes. and we come to Proust. Indeed. Are you going to write a book about Proust? I think it'll never happen now. Why? So you're very sweet to ask. Well, um, after I finished my book on Henry Kissinger in the late 80s, and finished my sort of tour promoting it and trying my attempt to bring him to justice, I became aware in myself of a slight slackening of commitment to politics. I was finding the left less congenial for reasons I've given you. I didn't find the right very attractive. I've, I've always spent the greater part of my journalistic life on politics, but at least 40% of it on writing about literature. Uh, doesn't often get said about me, I suppose because it's less high profile in a way. It's actually more interesting, have, I think. You know, a great deal more interesting, and it, uh, there's a great deal more to learn from it. I've published a lot of stuff about George Eliot, Charles Dickens, mm -hmm. George Orwell, and so on. And I decided I was the right time of life to take on a proper reading of Proust's Remembrance of Things Past. Have you read it? I got it. I got hold of a copy of uh, the Scott Moncrief edition as retranslated, updated by my, my late friend Terry Kilmartin, and decided to go through it and um, make notes all the way with the view of writing something about it, maybe a short book. And I can't tell you what it was like. Uh, I, I was terrified when I was halfway through the closing volume. I thought, I wish there were several more. I, I'm one of those who really wished Proust was longer. And oh, I think that shows yeah. exactly the right time of life. Everyone, almost everyone, makes the mistake at some point of trying it too soon. How and then not, not getting on with it. Well, I was, I was probably about 19 when I first tried it, which is a huge mistake. I think that's when I tried it, and it, it, <clears> it so got the longers. Oh, that I, I, I just don't think it can make any sense at all, because unless you're at least as old as Proust was, in other words, I'd say mid-40s, you're not going to get the various disillusionments and disappointments. You won't understand them at all, or the, or the tremendous urgency with which he says he thinks time can be regained. It isn't all lost. Nothing's completely wasted if you approach it in the right way. Things can be, can be redeemed for you. Um, and I finished it and finished making my notes on um, something like the 9th of September 2001. <laughs> and, uh, well, you know the rest. I, know. I got drawn back into politics. In fact, something I'd been telling people all my life you may try and escape engagement, you may try and escape commitment, but politics will come and get you, it'll come and find yeah, you. I yeah. hadn't been taking my own advice. Are you mellowing like a good bottle of red, do you think? Um, hope not. I, I check myself for symptoms of... Um, of mellowness. Yes, all the time. Or of, you know, becoming an old curmudgeon as well. I'm acutely sensitive to that. I, I think probably not, no. But... You would be the better judge, perhaps. Are you still finding you wanna, life... If you want to un, un, uncork and gingerly sniff me. <laughs> <laughs> I, somebody said to me... I could use a bit of decanting. Perhaps. I was having a conversation the other day about dying with somebody. We were talking, you know, having one of those conversations. I know. And so this person said, I don't want to die for a while. I want to see what happens. <laughs> yes. I suppose you could sort of say that any time. I get depressed you? at the thought of the newspaper that will come out the day after. Yes. I mean, even if it has an article about me, which I'll miss. <laughs> well, well, maybe you could get the them to do the, the obituary before opening, you die. The opening of my book is, is about the experience of reading of myself oh, yes, in the past tense. Oh, yes, that is true. And if you, if you haven't had it, which I dare say you haven't, it's quite rare, it does, it's true, it concentrates the mind to read the words of the late Christopher Hitchens. 
I thought, well, now at least I know what my first chapter can be about. <laughs> and the last one, obviously, will have to be written by someone else. Mm. But um, Leopold Bloom says in Ulysses, you should read your obituary notices. It uh, gives you a new lease on life. <laughs> it's good to meet you. Thank, Thank you for you. joining us. Oh, it's been a pleasure. And the final bit is the Beethoven. It's a sort of nice ending to the program. Do you want me to say anything about it? Oh. Well, there's all countries, this one included, have at one time or another had a national anthem problem. And the solution to the European Union's problem was to adopt this, the, the climactic Ode to Joy from the Ninth Symphony, as the anthem of the Union. And even though the Union may be in deep trouble, I, I think that as long as anyone in the world ever thinks about, could there ever be an anthem that was for humanity altogether, in respect of a state or country, I think it would probably have to be this one. That's the conclusion that's of the, the Ode wrong to Joy. That's the wrong bit. Oh, right. It <laughs> was the, the, Ode to the Joy. bit that became... Um, well, that's the conclusion of the Ode to Joy. Yes. Sorry. Uh, sorry about that. I, I must have sent you a, a, a bad notation. Never um, mind. Never mind. We got the I, message, I think. Yeah. Could you play it some other time? <laughs> of course we could. Christopher, thanks um, for talking to us. We've got well, to nothing's go. perfect. Nothing? Hey, it's been very nice of you to have me. Well, thank you. And uh, Christopher Hitchens' memoir is called Hitch 22, and it's published by Alan and Unwin.